Should I do it now? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, it, 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 so it, it was like we were having a regular conversation. Well, uh, my name is Alfred Ross Dill, and I'm an educator uh, and content creator. Um, to keep it 100% real, uh, reading was not huge in my family. Um, so, you know, there weren't books around when I was young. There were albums. I read album covers a lot, believe it or not. The back of album covers I read a lot. Um, you know, but there weren't like books around. Uh, one of the magazines that was always around though was Jet. Jet Magazine was around a lot. Um, so I was able to read that. Uh, uh, so that was, that was a lot of fun reading Jet. But my aunt, uh, who was the first in our family to go to college, my aunt Lisa, uh, when I was in middle school, she began to buy me books for Christmas. Um, you know, and one of the first books that, that I remember reading cover to cover was uh, Catch, a Fi Catch a Fire. Uh, it was uh, the um, uh, autobiography of um, Bob Marley. And that like changed my life because what that did is as a sixth, or sixth grade, I think it was a seventh grader when I read that book, um, it started opening me up to different cultures, different cultural experiences. Uh, it, it opened me up to, to learning more about myself, more about my history. Um, and it started to open up different worlds of books for me. So that's when I started reading. I really started to read to gain knowledge of myself and who I was as a black man in, in this country and what it meant to be a black man in this country. Another thing that I would have to say, I would, if I didn't share this, um, it, it would be unfair, but as I went to Sunday school, so, you know, uh, we learned to read the Bible, right? So, and it's funny because a lot of times when people say, well, wh when did you start reading? We don't, I don't usually talk about the Bible, but I learned to read the Bible, you know, through Sunday school. So that was huge. There were always Bibles in my grandmother's house. Uh, so I would read a lot of the Bible. And what I would start doing is, <laughs> I, you know, when I started to despise uh, Sunday school, as I got older, I didn't like going because I wanted to do other things instead. You know, um, I would spend all of Saturday reading the Bible just so that I can try to trick, not trick, but outwit the Sunday school teacher on Sunday. So I would read different verses and parables, and then I would come with the intent on Sunday to kind of, you know, <laughs> you know, to be that, that one student in the class <laughs> that uh, stumps the teacher, and I would try to stump the Sunday school teacher. So that was a motivator for me, <laughs> you know, uh, to read. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I guess it was, it, it was, you know, literacy was important in terms of to church and when you study even when you study um you know black americans and black people in this country um church and in bible that that was usually the first reading um you know and, and, and some people were killed for learning to read the bible you know black folks so but that was you know the church is where literacy was not only reading but the spoken word as well um it was a it was a big part you know of of uh of the black experience in, in this country. So I'm glad that I remember that because I think that that's important too. Because when we think about reading, we automatically, just like you start talking about, we think about like these preferred spaces, like where these spaces should be, a library, you know, uh, a book room. You should have a bookshelf in your, in your home, and, you know, like your mother should read to you. And those things are all great. Um, but, you know, there's different ways that, that people, you know, come across in, in terms of literacy um, and then valuing literacy. Um, they value it differently. So. <laughs> I remember novels were all chosen for us uh, as students, you know, like it was like we read all through the canon, you know, um, very seldom did we get a chance to choose a book. But I remember when I did get a chance to choose a book, the books I fell in love with right in Long Branch High School Library uh, when I was in high school, I fell in love with choose your own adventure books. And those were the biggest escape for me. Um, and I just love the idea that I had choice in the book 
within the book, you know? And then when you take that to a broader level of having choice to read what you want to read, like that, that gave me agency. And I think that that's one of the things that children are missing now is kind of like agency in their learning. Um, so, you know, for those teachers out there, educators out there, uh, you know, release those books, man. Let, let's, <laughs> you know, let, let students read. And because the discussions that can come from the text, that's where, you know, the, that's where the learning, believe it or not, is, is, is occurs, you know, um, opening up those worlds of, of discussion and language, um, you know, in, 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 in getting kids to, to share their, their thoughts on different pieces. Uh, that, that's where it extends, man. I was born in 75, so I was reading uh, when I, the stories that I'm talking about growing up, you know, from 80s to early 80s, you know, um, and there weren't many books. I don't remember any books growing up like where like black children were in, in, at the center or black folks were at the center. Um, I didn't start. And, and it's not that those books didn't exist, you know, because those you, you go and study, you know, the, the Harlem Renaissance, those books were there. But it was it was it came it came down to the folks like you explained earlier in the classrooms who are making decisions about curriculum, who are making decisions, you know, um, about what students should be reading. They did. They weren't inclusive. You know, um, they were making decisions based on what they they grew up, uh, you know, reading. So and what they value. So I think that as educators, we need to do a better job of making sure that there are characters that represent inclusive and diverse environments that we diverse environments that we live in today um, and tell these different stories. And, you know, I'm happy. I'm happy that there's more conversation around that. Um, there seems to be in a lot of school districts, more conversation about diversifying, you know, the, the literature uh, to, to, to fit, you know, our society. I was an average, average to below average student, um, but I'll never forget my eighth grade year. Um, there, were, there was a teacher, her name was Mrs. Falcone. I didn't even have this teacher as a teacher, right? Um, so she came to me at the end of the year in the Long Branch Middle School, and she said, I want you to, uh, to do the speech for the eighth grade graduation. And I was like, what? You know, it kind of like, it, it caught me way off guard um, because I didn't even know this lady, right? So long story short, um, she convinced me to, to, to do the speech. And I had to memorize this speech, which I still have partly memorized to today. Um, it was for the, um, the Presidential Academic Achievement Award, which is still given at eighth grade graduate. That's like the award for eighth graders, right? So it's a nationally recognized um, uh, award. And I gave this speech in front of, you know, 800 people. And then there's a video still of it today. And it just, it, it, it gave me a space to, to kind of a realization that, oh my God, first I was able to memorize this, this speech, right? Because I couldn't read it from a paper. Um, and then I was able to deliver it in front of 800 people. And it kind of started making me think like, wow, man, like, you know, you can you can have 800 people, you know, uh, kind of looking and watching at your every word, and you know, deliver a speech. That's pretty cool as an eighth grader. And that's when I started to take public speaking really seriously. Um, you know, but to to go full circle again, it kind of, it's funny because going back to Sunday school, I keep going back there. But one of the things we had to do for every Christmas and every Easter is we had to pick one Bible verse. And we had to memorize that Bible verse. And then we would have to stand up in front of the whole church congregation and recite it, right? So that, I guess, in many ways prepared me <laughs> for the memorization piece of, of that speech. But once I gave that speech, I felt my peers looked at me differently. Um, I felt teachers looked at me differently. Um, I felt good about myself um, in a school setting because up until that time, I never felt 
a real connection to school. Um, so that kind of pushed me from eighth grade year going into freshman year to be like, okay, like, you know, this school thing, I can, I can find a space here, you know? So a shout out, you know, to Mrs. Falcone, who I'm sure is no longer with us. Um, and I'm sad that I didn't keep in good contact with her. Um, but again, she was not even my teacher. And to this day, I still don't know why she chose me. You know, I, I really don't. Um, but Another thing for educators is that, you know, sometimes that, that speaking life and speaking existence into, into folks, you know, in spaces is really important. And believing in them when they don't even believe in themselves and young people, I think is really important. Language comprehension is so, so important. So the way that, you know, because the, the, the brain and reading like that is the most unnatural thing, believe it or not. Like learning to read is the hardest thing to do because it's really unnatural. Now speaking is more of a natural thing and learning language is more natural. You know, like for, for example, when, when, when kids go to school, they usually are language proficient. Like they, they, they can speak, you know, but they're not readers yet at four year, in, in mo most cases, three year old, four year olds, they're not readers because, you know, reading is, you know, is something that has to, it's a decoding involved. L our brains are hardwired for language, right? So I'm saying all of that to say this, the, the way that young people become better readers as we're talking all the way from, from pre-K, uh, little, little toddlers, is from stories being read to them and language being exposed. Now, once they get older, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, discussions about these stories, questions about these stories, um, and they begin to comprehend language. And then they take that language comprehension and when they become, you know, fluent, when they get better at reading and learn to read, those things kind of come together and blend together. So then you have this language comprehension, you have this phonics and phonemic awareness, all of that stuff. And then it starts to come together as one. And that's what creates readers, you know. So I say that to say this, listening to a book is now tapping into that whole language comprehension piece. You know, uh, so it, it's taking, it, it, it's still reading, you know, you, you still are reading and there is still some visualization that goes into, you know, in, into that and in that language comprehension. So that, that is really, really important in, in educators. You know, I think we need to get out of that mode that, you know, listening to the spoken word um, is not reading and then you, you there are many cultures that were built upon the spoken word uh that were there they, they weren't written language there wasn't a written language it was spoken words and it's you know oratory it was passed on generation to generations so we can't devalue that because when we devalue that we're actually devaluing you know a piece of um some folks culture you know um so i'm a big like I'm always into, into listening, um, whether it's podcasting, because that's another language comprehension. You're building knowledge. You know, the, 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 the way that you become a good in terms of comprehension and reading is you have to have a good knowledge base. You, you got to build knowledge. So building that knowledge is through that language comprehension, through that listening, um, you know, whether it's a podcast, whether it's an audio book, what have you. You know, I think that those things are, are really important you know, um, to, to building, to building knowledge. I, my grandmother used to do that to us. She would tell us stories about her growing up. Um, she, and it wasn't like, sit down, let me tell you a story, but you would just sit around and something would happen. And then she would just start talking about a time down South, a time in Georgia, when this happened, when that happened. Um, there was a, you know, a lot of our family history was, given to me through stories. Um, and and I, I just think that, you know, through parable um, and through story is, is, the, is one of the best ways of, of learning um, and, and those stories sit. And I did, I used to spend a lot of time, again, where now if I was being evaluated and I was doing that, there's a good chance I would get a bad evaluation, you know, because I'm telling too many stories. Um, but it kind of hooked learners, you know, um, and, and now when I still talk to kids, one of the things that they always say is, oh, man, you, you always kept it real. That class was so real because I always tried to draw some type of parable or, or connection to 
what the school experience was and class experience was, but then how that equated to the world experience. Um, and if, if you're not, if you're not doing that, you know, it's funny because I'm doing a little project on Ta-Nehisi Coates is uh, Between the World and Me. And that's a perfect example because if you're not creating a bridge between the world and between your classroom and the student, then there's no way <laughs> that you're ever going to have a learning community or learning environment because the kids are going to see your class as a place that they go to get a grade and not a place that they go to get whether it's encouragement, whether it, it's, it's uh, some type of truth or knowledge, uh, whether it's some type of perspective, um, whether it's a, a, a space where they can feel vulnerable enough to share their own weaknesses. If you're not creating those kind of environments in your classroom, then kids are going to see it as a separate place. They're not going to see it as, you know, a space where the world happens. They're going to see it as, oh, I go to class to get a grade to please the teacher and then I leave, um, as opposed to I go to a community to, to, to have, you know, learning experiences uh, with people who I don't even, I didn't even know before this. My wife and I, we were watching the movie Soul. Uh, it's a new Disney movie and it's brilliant um, because it talks a lot about what you just said, finding purpose and, you know, how, how we do that, you know, um, and, and how we, pretty much how we're taught not to do that, um, you know, um, in, in society, because we, we kind of get these images and ideas of, of what life should be. And we kind of attach our life to those things, as opposed to going inside and find out what you're on fire about, what you love to do and what you're passionate about. So in terms of finding purpose, it's got to be the thing that when you do it, um, it feels like this natural flow like, you know, thing, right? So for example, I said, when I introduced myself as an educator and as a content creator, I'm, I'm passionate about both of those things, right? And um, one of the, the stories I have with my son, we were taking a walk and I started a podcast recently for content creation. And he was like, um, you know, do you, you know, do you, are you passionate about that? Because I was telling him he's got to find things that he's passionate about. And I was like, yeah, I said, I love doing that. Right. So he was like, well, are you passionate about your job that you go to every day? And I had to think for a second and I was like, wow, that's a good question now, you know, and the, the answer to that was, you know what, I'm more passionate about the content creation, you know? Um, and he said, then why don't you do that instead of, you know, your work? And I said, well, I like what I do too. I'm passionate about what I do. I said, but, um, you know, I, I feel that and when you when you become an adult, and I said you'll have this experience, there's a part of you that is going to have to be uh, responsible in the sense of creating, you know, a space for your family, you know, and providing for your family, and that may not always be what you're passionate about. I said, but that job that 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 does that. But I said one thing that you have to do is you have to make sure you're finding time to 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 discover more about what you're on fire about, like what, what, you, what you really love to do. Um, and I said, and then once you get to the point where that thing that you're really on fire about and passionate about can be your full-time job, then you, you move over, you know, to that. Um, so I, I guess, you know, in, in terms of young people finding that space and, you know, it, it's really about, you know, believing, you know, whatever it is that, that, that you really love and what you really enjoy, um, believing in it and, and, and learning as much as about it um, and, and bringing and making the world fit around that thing. Um, you know, I, I think that when, when you do that and, and you don't try to fit that thing around the world, um, but you make the world fit around that thing, it starts to change things. So I've since from that conversation with my 10 year old son, I started building podcasting into my job. Okay. Um, whereas um, I, I have a podcast now for educators in my school district. 
okay, that we do weekly. The next thing that I'm working on is, because uh, my job is about curriculum development, is building courses on podcasting, uh, content creation, because that, and I think this COVID time has taught us that there is definitely, you know, a medium out there that we have, we have yet to fully tap into in terms of young people creating content um, and, and us identifying that content, you know, as, as, as something, you know, that, that is meaningful. I mean, content is knowledge, right? So that, that's how we're looking at content. So content creation is really creating a space where, where you're putting a bunch of knowledge and fitting it into it. So let's say you're into gaming. Let's say you're into Roblox. Let's say you're, you're into Among Us now. That's a big one. Um, and maybe you say, I want to create content. So I want to create you know, uh, knowledge around this. So I'm good at this game. I want to teach other people how you can be good at this game. So I'm going to create content. So I'm going to start a Twitch channel. I'm going to start a YouTube channel. I'm going to get a Voxer, you know, Facebook, Instagram, IG, whatever you're going to do. And I'm going to start doing tutorials on this game, right? So I'm going to play the game. And as, as I'm playing this game, I'm going to teach you pointers on how to play it. So again, this goes back to literacy because what you're doing is you're building knowledge. You're you're building content knowledge. And that's what creates comprehension and people understanding things, right? So content content creators is find something that you're passionate about. It could be anything. Um, It can be Barbie dolls. Um, You know, it it could be gaming, like I mentioned earlier. It could be reading. Uh, It can be like anime, maybe that. You can create content around that. But it's creating a source of knowledge where, where people can go to one space and learn all that you want to teach them about a specific content or a specific uh, thing that you like to do. Uh, it could be soccer. It, it could, listen, the content is up to you. Um, you know, so if, if teachers out there, especially in, in language arts, a good idea is to have a, a part of, you know, we talk about grading and evaluation, but some type of content creation, you know, um, a, a space in, in, you know, in your curriculum and in your class experience where students are responsible for creating content uh, based on something that they're passionate about and something that they're in fire about. Uh, because once you begin to do that, now you're starting to open up, you know, th- those worlds uh, of, you um, of, of those different experiences and you learn, I mean, I learned so much, you know, that's why I wanted to, to do podcasts in the first place because I was interviewing teachers um, as an administrator and the stories that teachers have are so like powerful and like encouraging, and, you know, I'm like, well, I'm blown away. And then they get into the classroom and I go and see them teaching. I'm like, hold up, where's that person that interviewed? Like, because they put that person on the shelf and then they come into the classroom to be the teacher that they think they need to be. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We need that experience that you talked about at the interview to come out. Um, and, and that, you know, and they need to feel like it's okay for that to come out. So students are the same way in classrooms where there's some things that they're on fire about inside, but they feel like it doesn't fit into this classroom, you know? So it goes back to, how do we find a way to make the world fit around that thing as opposed to make that thing fit around the world, you know? Um, so I, I think, you know, if students are on fire about things, they need to get, you know, they need to have the opportunities to express that, you know, um, that being on fire with, you know, in the classroom setting and create content, you know, about those, those different things that they're passionate about. Switching, you know, is the technical term for uh, behaviors that we have to take on to exist and thrive in different environments, right? So those behaviors can be, you know, linguistic, it can be language, um, it can be gestures, okay? Um, You know, it can be a, a pound, okay? All right, that's a language. So if, if I'm, a, I'm a teacher, right? And you see a lot of this now, and I, I think part of it is kind of getting corny, but you know, when kids would come into my class, you know, there's some kids I would give a pound to when they came in, all right? Like that was, that was like 
and when when kids would see that, hold up, a teacher's giving me a pound. So it's like a teacher is speaking my language in this setting, like in the school, they're doing that. So that's code switching, you know, but it can't, it has to be genuine. It can't be this made up thing that, you know, you're kind of put on this front or this air, you know, um, but also, you know, in a lot of teachers are now, you see these videos on social media, they have these different, you know, handshakes for everyone, which is all good. But to get to the nitty gritty of that, because what that is really about is, it's about seeing someone's culture. All right. It, it's about, that's what it's about. That, that's how that happens. Right. It's like, I identify and I see your culture and I'm putting my, I'm, 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 I'm approving of your culture. You know, like I'm embracing your culture. That's what that pound is, right? Like, I feel you. I see you. It's a form of respect, right? So if it's coming from that space, it's beautiful because that's how relationships are built. You know, that, 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 that is, that, that's the structure of relationships. That, that's how it happens. And Jason Reynolds talks a lot about this as well, you know, like how do we build these meaningful relationships? Um, but a lot of it is time and space and being in the margins with people um, in, in, in decentering yourself and getting to know who these young people are and what makes them tick and what makes them go. Part of my experience is growing up is that there was a lot of code switching that had to occur, right? So I had to be different people in different spaces. You know, I had to be, I, I was, I was in between homes. Uh, so I lived a lot with my grandmother, but then I also lived a lot with my mom and then my dad. Um, and then sometimes, you know, with relatives. So I had to learn, believe it or not, to be different people in different spaces. So that became a thing. Uh, growing up in the community that I grew up, um, there, there, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a space that, that you could always, that you could be vulnerable or weak in. So I had to, to learn to, to be tough, even when I didn't want to be tough, to be assertive, even when I didn't want to be assertive, be confrontational, even when I didn't want to be confrontational. Um, but I had to learn to be those things, um, you know, in, until I was able to get home and get into my room and play a video game and do the nerd type of things that I like to do. So it was finding, you know, those experiences helped me in a classroom because I, I learned that there needed to be different codes and, and things of that nature. Um, and that was something that I was open with students about. A big part of code switching is learning language, music, all right? My daughter, I'm all over her. You know, I let her do any type of, she's on our title account, any type of song list that she wants to do, any type of playlist she wants to do, there's no restriction on it, right? Because what I like to do is learn that playlist because I know now that that is a language that she's speaking and that's a language that speaks to her those songs are a soundtrack to her life right now so if i can learn more about those songs i'm going to learn more about layla that i'm not going to learn by hey layla let's sit down because i want to talk to you about now that's not how it's going to happen but now if i can enter her world through a conversation based on a song which is language you know uh art then now we can start up this whole conversation right Fortnite. I'm not a big Fortnite fan, but, and I love games, but I'm not a big into Fortnite, but my son loves it. So if I can learn more about Fortnite, then I can learn more about that. So code switching um, and, and learning language outside of the dominant language is so important in identifying it as a language. And then if you can take that, that norm and language to other spaces, you start to break down you know, barriers, you know, and that's why it's important to have inclusivity. That's why it's important to have diversity. Sometimes we think it's just, oh, it looks good. No, it's really about bringing in all of these different perspectives and voices and languages, and then us identifying like, wow, these things are, these are essential. This is the way, you know, this is their experience. So if I, if I, if I diminish their language, and if I say, you can't talk like that in this class, then what I'm saying is, is, I don't like the way your mom talks. I don't like the way your dad talks. I don't like the way your grandma, these are people that they love talk, you know? Um, one of the things that, that I use is if there is some language or something that is not appropriate for a setting, right? I'll say, well, hey, you know, around here, that's not 
an appropriate way to talk, all right? But again, I'm saying around here. So that doesn't mean in your neighborhood, that may be an appropriate way to talk, but around here, meaning in this classroom setting, maybe in this school setting. So now I'm not diminishing. I'm just saying around here, it's not, you know, uh, because there's some languages, you know, and, and there's some things that uh, in, in different environments that should not, you know, that, that it's not going to bode well, you know, for, for many different reasons. But, but kids need to, to be aware of that and understand how to be swift and changeable, but yet remainable, how to kind of be able to navigate in these different circles, uh, still remaining themselves but maybe speaking, you know, different languages in, in different spaces. And that was something that, man, I, listen, in order for me <laughs> to be who I am and what I am today, I had to learn so many languages, uh, you know, because I, I just had to, because I would not be able to exist professionally where I can go into a room with superintendents and speak. Um, but then I can also go and speak with some 13 year old, 12 year olds, 11 year olds. Like I said, I have a book club, you know, with 10, 11, 12 year olds, you know? So, but if I'm not able to speak their language and hear their language, then I'm dead in that world. And, and as educators, we can't be dead in worlds, you know, like if we're dead in worlds, you know, we're, we're losing. And, and, you know, so I, I think, I think I like to call it code switching. Um, because I, I, A, that's a technical term, and B, it, it me, to me, it's like, it's, it, it's like a power move. Like, I feel like, yo, if I, if I could, like, I think it's powerful, like, to be able to go and, and, and speak these different languages in different spaces, you know. Um, you know, one of, one of the greatest compliments I've received, uh, a, a, a person, one of my peers, he was like, I just like the way that you can, you can speak technical about education, but then you also can like break it down to make someone who may not be a technical person understand it. You know, that's cool. That, that is in a sense, that's code switching, you know, um, you know, it, it taking that and breaking it down, you know, and, and, and having people, uh, even my hat to the back, like that was one of the things, you know, I, I like I wear my hat to the back, like that's how I wear it. So does that mean that, I'm not an educator because I do that. Does that, does that mean I, you should devalue everything that comes out of my mouth because of the way, you know, like, but again, that's another form of communication. The way we wear our clothes is a form of communication. Okay. So if we are just diminishing those forms of communication from young people, then we are pretty much dis dismantling their culture and what's important to them. Feel like there's a tax to speaking the truth and I'm willing to pay that tax, you know, um, because it would be very easy to maneuver and manipulate and climb the ladder of success and be, you know, you know, whatever, you know, whatever that means to you. Um, but then sometimes it's not being the real you. And at, at the end of the day, the real you is who you got to look in the mirror at night. And that sounds corny, but it's true, you know? Um, and if you're not being that, so what is, you know, what, what's, what's it all worth? <laughs> Whether it's a position that you secure, a space in a, a office that you secure, what, what have you, a status that you get, what is it worth if it's, if it's not like the real you, you know? And do these people really know who you are? Yeah. yeah, because that's important. Like, do they really know who you are, um, you know, or do they know a version of you that, you know, that, but again, that's the, the depth of this is because sometimes we have to create those versions to protect spaces, you know, like, and that that's where the whole love comes from and you know being able to have these these spaces where we can be vulnerable and not feel that 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 vulnerability will be used against us at that time or at a later time you know that's love that's what love is you know uh and when we can't do that that's where love doesn't exist because we are creating these facades and these images of who we are, you know, uh, and what we are and what we're, what we're really about. And that's not really love. And it goes back to that pound and that handshake. If I'm just doing it for the surface level and it's not this deep 
connection there, you know, and it's like a kid can feel when it's real, you know, like they can feel it. People can feel real love, you know, like they can feel it. And, and kids are really good at that. And they can also feel when, you know, it's fake, you know, um, you're just doing that, <laughs> you know, uh, so it's, it's complex. It really is. <sighs> my legacy man i you know what i'd be happy if it just if I, just to keep this thing going you know um my whole thing is is about creating spaces where young people can be inspired to continue doing work that they believe is important. Um, and if I can support that, that's creating the legacy, you know, that, that I think is needed. Um, it's bigger than me. It's bigger than anything that I can do. Um, and, and my whole thing is like, yo, how, how can I connect with young people, with youth to get in and to become passionate about things and really push for these things? Um, I talked about these alumni groups. Um, that's, that's a legacy because that means that in these places and spaces I've never occupied, there are folks who are going there, young people who are going there and putting pressures on systems to make sure that they're being more inclusive in their hiring practices, their curriculum. Like that's, I couldn't do that. So the fact that I can work with young people and developing these plans to do that for their communities. And I've never stepped foot in these communities <laughs> Listen, that I, you know, I'm good with that, you know, because that, that's the work, you know, that, 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 that's the work. And, you know, and, and that's the work that we've always been about. Even when we go back to, you know, our time teaching, you know, next door to each other, we, we were about even our, our, our assignments were working with disenfranchised, undereducated students, right? Like un misunderstood kids. That's who we, we, are, we were attracted to those kids. Those kids were attracted to us. Uh, administrators at the time saw that and placed us in those positions where those kids would have never been able to be successful in other settings with other teachers. Um, so, you know, when you start talking about legacy, man, that's what it's about. And I, I'm like, I always want to be about that. I always want to be about speaking the truth, about, you know, empowering young people, uh, believing in those who unfortunately were not always believed in, um, you know, in, in, in helping to support their growth, you know, and, and I feel like that's, that's what we did back then. Um, and there's still people, there's still, you know, they're not kids anymore, but you cross path with them and there's that smile, there's that embrace, there's that realness, you know, because they knew it was more than just an assignment for you. It was more than just a job. It was more than a check. It was like, yo, you really, you really care, you know? Um, and until that point, no one really cared, you know what I mean? They didn't get that feeling. So I think, I think that that, you know, that's what legacy is to me, is continuing, you know, to, to continue in that work. My name is Alfred Rawls Dill, and I'm an educator and a content creator. You may want to do it again. You forgot the doctor. I think you should. I, think I didn't do it in the beginning when either. Are I didn't say sure? doctor. I didn't. I'll, I yeah, I'll do it, do. though. I didn't. Uh, my name is Dr. Rawls Dill, and I'm an educator, and I'm a content creator. Core Bang